Hey everybody, it's John King with Summit Funding. It is Friday the 9th of June, although I'm recording this on Thursday because I'm headed out of town tomorrow. So when you're receiving this, I will be out of town. Uh, so I wanna give you uh, my weekly update and I've got four topics I'm gonna talk about today. The first one is, okay, the debt ceiling's resolved. What does that mean for interest rates? We're gonna talk about that and do kind of a deep dive into that piece. We're gonna talk about student loan payments and what's going to happen because of the debt ceiling resolution, what's going to happen to student loan payments, and kind of a refresher course on what lenders look for in student loans and, and how we navigate those waters. We're going to talk about the insurance debacle in California because we've now got State Farm and Allstate that have pulled out of providing insurance for homeowners in California. And then finally, I'm going to talk about California Dream for All, the 20% down payment assistance program and how you need to get yourself your friends, your family, your neighbors, prepared to take full advantage of that program when it is released. So let's go ahead and get started. So first of all, the debt ceiling issue was resolved last weekend. Great, great news, but why are interest rates still high? So we had rates rise significantly in the month of May, and a lot of it had to do with issues revolving around the debt ceiling and concerns that, hey, the federal government's going to default on their debt. And if they do, it's going to downgrade the credit quality of the government, which means they're going to have to charge higher interest rates to get people who are willing to invest in them. Because, well, it's kind of like being a, a borrower with low credit scores. If you have a low credit score and you want to borrow money, you're going to have to pay a higher interest rate. Well, if the federal government has a low credit rating. They would have to pay a higher interest rates in order to borrow money. Exactly the same concept. We avoided that but rates went up in anticipation of that happening. So we would expect rates to come right back down now that that didn't happen. Well, that's not altogether true. First of all, the fact is the government's been playing chicken with their debt and there's some lingering impact of that. It's kind of like having some late payments on, on your bills. Hey, you might've caught it up, but you still were kind of on the precipice of filing bankruptcy. That's a little bit concerning for a lender. More importantly is, People don't understand when the government said that back in January of this year, they had to start taking extraordinary measures in order to not exceed the debt ceiling number. Let me give you a simple explanation of what those extraordinary me measures mean in terms of what your personal budget would look like. So the government was told you can't borrow any more money because you've got a limit on how much money you can owe. That's like your credit card is telling you, look, you've hit your limit on how much you can borrow on credit cards and you can't borrow anymore. And so now you're trying to say, what extraordinary measures can I take? Well, one of the things that the government did is they stopped issuing new bonds and they actually started drawing down on money they had in their savings account, in their general fund. And so that general fund is normally around $600 billion and has dropped to $50 billion. So that means if you might have had you know, $6,000 in the bank as, as rainy day money, and now you're down to 500 bucks. Like that's kind of scary because your rainy day fund is gone. Well, that's what the government has done. And now they have to build back up the rainy day fund. So now that the credit card companies have said, hey, you can charge money again, you immediately go pull out a bunch of money in order to replenish your rainy day fund. That's what the government is about to do. Over the next 90 days, they're gonna issue a whole bunch of new 10-year uh, treasuries and, and different lengths, but basically the treasury bonds, which drive mortgage rates. And when there's more supply, there's more need for uh, the government to borrow money, they have to entice borrow uh, lenders, they have to entice investors. So we're seeing pressure on interest rates continue to go up. And one of the reasons we're seeing that is because of the fact that the government has held off on borrowing money for the last six months, and now they got to catch up. Now they have projects that they've been delaying that said, hey, we got to borrow money to work on that project, but now we can't because we have this limit on how much money we can owe in debt. Well, now if the limit's over, it's been increased, they can start that project, they can go borrow that money, but that's going to drive up the cost of borrowing the money. So it's really a catch-22 that we're in right now. Uh, the bottom line of where rates have been going is they've been going lower overall because inflation has been getting better. And I expect inflation to continue to get better, but the Federal Reserve is super concerned. They're going to be meeting next week, and next week they're going to be talking about, hey, should the 13th, yeah, next week. So they're going to be talking about, hey, should we raise interest rates or should we keep them the same? And it's a toss-up. I think that, that there's a lot of conversation that they're going to keep rates the same, um, but the truth is the Fed has been making it clear. We don't know that we're done. 
because inflation hasn't come down as much as we would have liked to have seen. The problem is it takes time for the inflation numbers to actually start dropping. And so we don't know where, what the Fed's going to do next week. Uh, the fact of the matter is that the markets are already looking at rates being higher for lots of factors. So even if the Fed raises interest rates, I don't expect it to make much of a difference at all. All right. So the next thing I want to talk about is what the heck is going on with student loans relative to the debt ceiling. Here's the deal. Student loan payments were paused back in 2020 because of COVID. And that pause has been postponed. In other words, the restart of student loan payments has been postponed over and over and over again. Well, guess what? Now that the debt ceiling issue has been resolved, part of the negotiation was that student loan payments must resume again uh, around August 30th. But what is that going to mean? It's going to mean a whole bunch of people who hadn't been making student loan payments that need to start making student loan payments. Now, some people have said, oh my gosh, it's going to lead to more foreclosures because you're going to have people that have more payments they have to make that they haven't been used to making. I don't know if that's really the case. The truth is lenders have had to count student loan payments in your budget. Now, you might not have counted it. You might have spent a whole bunch of money going to Disneyland every weekend because you didn't have student loans to pay for. So maybe you can't go to, to Disneyland anymore or not as often as you used to. But the fact of the matter is the money is there for people to pay for their student loan debt. And maybe that's going to help lower inflation as well. Because if you have to pay for your student loans and you don't have the money to go travel to Disneyland, then we're not having as much inflationary pressure of inflation going up. But what I want to talk about real quick is what are the rules now that you're going to have to start making student loan payments again? And how do we look at it? So the mortgage industry looks at student loans as a debt. But the good news is, is that there's some ways in which we can um, uh, work with the weird repayment plans that are out there. So even though it's 100% of debt, and even though we can't pretend, even if you're in a forbearance plan, even if you're uh, in some kind of a, a student loan forgiveness plan, we have to assume that you're going to have to make payments at some point in time, except in one situation. And that is with a conventional loan backed by Fannie Mae. Fannie Mae says we accept whatever the payment is, as long as they're in a payment plan, including income-based repayment plans. That's called an IVR. An IVR says, hey, I don't have very much income, or let, let, let me say it differently. An IBR says your monthly payment is based on your income. The more income you have, the higher the payment you have to make on student loans. The lower income you have, the lower the payment you make on student loans. And so Fannie Mae says, look, if they're on an IBR and the IBR calculation says they can't afford to make any payment on their student loan, then we're going to agree that we don't have to count a payment against them for their mortgage. But that's the only situation in which we can actually count a zero payment. Otherwise, what we're looking at is Freddie. And by the way, Fannie Mae says, if you don't have a payment and you're not in an IVR plan, then we have to count 1% of your balance as your monthly payment. Now, FHA and Freddie Mac say, we don't really care. We're just going to count a half a percent. So for people who had been on an IVR, because they've been forced into forbearance, they haven't been on a payment plan and I couldn't use their IBR payment. So the lowest payment I could use was half of a percent on Freddie Mac or FHA. The great news is once we start up the repayments again in September approximately, I'm going to be able to take people who are on an IBR that are making zero payment. If they qualify for a conventional loan, we can do a Fannie Mae conventional loan and I don't have to count the student loan payment at all. So as a matter of fact, people who have had a hard time qualifying for a mortgage due to student loan debt, you may have an easier time after September when your actual student loan payment is required. Kind of quirky, but I want to make sure you understand the ins and outs of how all of that works. Now, the next topic I want to talk about is what the heck is going on with insurance in the state of California. Last week, we had an, two weeks ago, there was an announcement that State Farm said we are no longer providing homeowners insurance in the state of California. It was a big blow because State Farm, I think, is like 15% of the policies in California are held by State Farm. And then right after that, Allstate announced exactly the same thing. And they said, nope, we're out. What the heck is going on and why are these insurance companies pulling out? Well, the first thing I'll tell you is this isn't unique to California. This has happened in other states in the Gulf states, uh, Florida. Again, I don't know exactly which states, so I'll say just in the, in the Gulf states. 
Um, there have been insurance companies pulling out because of issues with hurricanes and saying, look, we can't afford to continue to insure in that state because we're losing money. And that's really what State Farm and Allstate are saying in California. The cost of insurance in California has gone up significantly, not just for the consumer, but for the insurance company. And insurance companies are not in business to lose money. They're in business to basically take money from every single person and put it into a pool and then pay out a large amount to few people. And they have profit left over. But with inflation and with the state of California being unwilling to allow the insurance companies to increase insurance premiums as much as they've seen inflation go up and as much as they've seen the number of claims go up, the insurance companies are basically saying we're destined to lose money. Now, I think what we're in the middle of is a game of chicken between the insurance industry and the state of California. Now, I might be wrong. State Farm might be pulled out completely and permanently, but I've heard some rumors that this is temporary. And really, they're playing a game of chicken by saying, let us raise rates high enough that we can continue to operate in the state of California. We've got to be super careful because if the state of California, the insurance commission, does not allow insurance companies to raise rates high enough to cover what their costs are, then we're going to be stuck with essentially a, an insurance program that is funded by the states that gives you very, very little coverage for a very, very high cost. It's not very different than what we're dealing with in wildfire coverage in the high wildfire areas. Most insurance companies have said, look, I just won't write policies to cover fire damage in an area that is in a wildfire prone area because California's had so many fires, we're just destined to lose money. So the, a new program was created a few years back called the California Fair Plan. Now, the California Fair Plan is basically the state putting together this insurance that requires all insurance companies that operate in the state to participate. And so everybody, every insurance company in the state takes the risk of the fair plan. And that's one of the conditions of them operating in the state of California. Well, maybe State Farm said, you know what? Not only are we not making money on our regular policies, but we were being forced to participate in the fair plan. And if we pull out and we don't issue insurance in California, we don't have to worry about being a member of the fair plan. So there's a lot of, of challenges here because first of all, if enough insurance companies pull out, the state's not gonna have much of a choice but to create kind of another version of the fair plan that covers everything else, not just wildfire. But there's nothing fair about the fair plan. It's super expensive and it's got very, very low coverage. It's not much different than some of the biggest insurance companies in the world. The one I'm thinking of right now is Lloyd's of London. Lloyd's of London is basically an insurance company of last resort. They will give insurance, but super, super expensive and super low coverage. That's the direction we're headed. And I don't know where this is gonna land, but I do know that if we see more insurance companies pull out, we're going to have a bigger challenge in the state of California than what we have already. And I know nobody wants to pay higher insurance premiums, but look, it's the cost of, of insuring a home. It's the cost of the, the risk that is involved. And so it's just like, if you're gonna buy a Lamborghini, you gotta pay higher insurance because you have a high risk car. Well, guess what? You live in a, in a state like California where we have a lot of natural disasters and a very expensive region. Combine that with inflation and the cost of everything going up significantly. If the state continues to simply say, no, you can't raise your premiums more than this much because we're trying to protect the consumer, you don't protect the consumer very much by driving away all of the competition. That's kind of the opposite of protecting the consumer if there's no competition for them to choose from. So I think we got a major problem on our hands. I'm not sure where this is going to end up, but stay tuned and I'll keep you updated. The last thing I want to talk about is the California Dream for All program. Last Friday, I recorded a video about 30 minutes long. You can see the link down below, but I went through what I expect the, the um, time frame to be on the next release of the California Dream for All program. I also went through why I think you need to get started now. Because this program lasted only eight business days when it was released the first time. And I'm not sure it's going to last that much longer the next time it's released. So you need to be prepared now. I had so many clients the first time around that weren't prepared. 
They didn't have the credit score that was necessary. They didn't have, uh, you know, uh, the the history of income that we needed or their job. They didn't make enough money. And a couple of them were looking for new jobs. There's lots of things we can do to get you prepared. But what we can't do is rewind the clock because some things take time to be prepared. And I do not want you to be sitting in a situation where you regret missing it the second time around. Because I see house prices continuing to go up, especially with these programs where people are getting money they can use to pay for a high, pay a higher price for a home, but only if you buy within this short period of time. Well, guess what? People are going to pay significantly more for the home in order to get access to the dream for all money. So at least you want to be prepared ahead of time, know what neighborhood you want to live in, know what house prices are doing in that neighborhood, get connected with a great realtor, listen to that video that I did last week. I think it's really, really important for you to get prepared and to share the word. Because if you know anybody who's on the sidelines, not wanting to become a homeowner, not thinking homeownership is for them because the payment is too high. I can't save enough money for the down payment. I'm afraid to use my savings to a down payment. This program is a great opportunity to get them into a home. I helped seven families get into homes using this program, and I'd love to help significantly more the next time. So I appreciate your time today. Hope you have a wonderful weekend, and we'll talk to you soon. And if you need a mortgage, give me a call. Thanks.